welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good morning, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. I am your host, Mary Klaska, and I am very excited to journey with you through the heart of Jesus crucified and to find ways that you too can grow in holiness. Let's start our session with a prayer. Sweet Jesus, we come before you this day and we thank you for the gift of your love crucified. We thank you for the gift of your wounds. We ask you to wash us in your most precious blood. We ask you to teach us to love as you love. We ask you to help us to surrender to the plan the Father has for our lives the way that your mother did, the way that your foster father, St. Joseph, did, and the way that you did on the cross. We consecrate this program through the intercession of all the angels and saints to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O sacred heart of Jesus, we put all our trust in you. Immaculate and sorrowful heart of Our Lady, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. On this first show, what I would like to do is to look at the title of the show, The Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. And I'd like to go over those couple different parts. What is the heart? What is fiat? What is love crucified? And all the other shows will come out of this idea of us trying to find union with Jesus crucified. And ultimately, when we find union with Jesus crucified, we find union with Jesus resurrected. So the first word is heart, right? The heart of fiat crucified love. And the catechism in its section on prayer has some very beautiful reflections on what the human heart is. And so I'd just like to turn to that. Um, at the very beginning, it from the section of 2563, um, it says here, Scripture speaks sometimes of the soul or the spirit, but most often of the heart, more than a thousand times. According to Scripture, it is the heart that prays. If our heart is far from God, the words of prayer are in vain. And over the years, in the different apparitions of Our Lady, in Fatima, in Lourdes, in Medjugorje, she has constantly asked us to pray with the heart. She didn't just want the children to say prayers, the words of prayers over and over, but what she was asking is for us to pray with our heart, to have a heart-to-heart -heart connection and encounter with God. And so what is this heart that we're called to, to find and to pray from? And it's something very deep within us. It's the deepest part of us that actually prays. It says in the catechism that the heart is the dwelling place where I am, where I live. According to the Semitic or biblical expression, the heart is a place to which I withdraw. The heart is our hidden center beyond the grasp of our reason and of others. It's so deep that only the Spirit of God knows what's truly within our hearts, and that's in Scripture. Only the Spirit of God can fathom the human heart and know it fully. The heart is the place of decision deeper than our psychic drives. It is a place of truth where we choose life or we choose death. It is a place of encounter because as image of God, we live in relation 
It is the place of covenant. So it's very important anytime you're talking about the spiritual life to start from that foundation and that source of our being within ourselves, which is our heart. We don't want to, we can come to God through our mind and we can come to God, you know, through our actions and different ways. But the deepest place where we're transformed is when we have a heart to heart union with God, meeting with God. And by my heart touching his heart or his heart actually reaching out to touch my heart, that is how I'm transformed. I love the theology of Père Thomas Philippe, and he was a French theologian. He actually wrote the dogma of the Assumption, and he was a Dominican. He was brilliant, and he gave the keynote address in Rome when the Pope declared that dogma. And because he was so brilliant and did so much great work for the church, he was greatly calumniated by his Dominican community, unfortunately. And he endured a lot of persecution and they, for a long time they went and they, it was kind of like a pr imprisonment. They locked him away in a monastery in Italy and um, his family didn't even know where he was. And there's a story that after years of looking for him, a niece found him and came to the monastery and asked if he was there and asked if she could talk to him. And the monk that answered the door said, oh, he's here, he's here. We don't know why he's here. But we do know one thing, that man is a saint. And he would just sit in the chapel and he would pray. Well, after years of such persecution, his community decided to further persecute him. And they sent him to a little village in France. So here is this great theologian who wrote this great dogma and had this great theology and understanding of, um, of theology within the church. And they sent him to this little village in, in France where there was one Catholic who was a mentally handicapped man. And that was their way of trying to break him. But God's ways are not our ways. And great saints find ways through surrendering to the will of God to grow in sanctity, even in the midst of persecution. And he um, embraced this mission that was given to him. And he began to see that this man who would come to Mass and who would bring his other mentally handicapped friends to Mass would fall into ecstasy during Mass. And he realized that how advanced in prayer these mentally handicapped people were and how they were able to have an encounter with God of the heart that was deeper and greater than even the the intellectuals that he had worked with for years and years. So he rewrote his whole theology, and I love it. It's a theology of the heart, Père Thomas Philippe. And what he wrote was that the human person is made up of kind of three different like levels or um, three different stages. And the first or the last actually would be the age of reason, which when a child reaches age seven, um, more or less, they begin to relate to the world um, in reason, so through the mind. But before they're, they're seven years old, when they're still about 18 months till about seven, they live in what the front, he called in French the life of the spirit, although the word spirit had a different connotation than it does in English. But in that time, children live in this, in this relationship to the world where it's not quite reason, but it's more um, a world of symbols and of colors. And, you know, children love to make puzzles at this time, like where a certain part fits in the whole. They're figuring out their place in the family. And so where I fit in society, where I fit in the family, um, colors, shapes, sizes, things like that. It's more of the realm of, um, you know, when we pray and God were to share with us um, different kind of prophetic images or sensations or smells or things that connect us to him that might not be quite reason, but it's not the highest way of relating to him. And, and what Pierre Thomas Philippe taught was that the greatest way to relate to God 
is the way that a child relates to God who is under 18 months old. Pierre Thomas believed that when Jesus said, you have to become like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven, that he actually meant you must become like a child under the age of 18 months old. Because you look at the way an infant relates to the world, an infant within the womb of their mother and an infant within the arms of their parents. And it's a relationship that he called a relationship of the heart, a relationship of love. Babies know love. They know when they're being loved and they receive that love and return that love in a way that's inexplicable, that a way that is not visible in colors and shapes and words and all of that. And something that's inexplicable in um, reason. And, and, you know, they, they're not sitting there, you know, reasoning out their relationship with their mom. They're receiving love and they're giving love. And it's, it's really beautiful. I've spent a lifetime with small children, with babies. And even if a baby that's really little is attached to their mother and you take them and they might be upset at first because they're attached to their mother, if you love them, they respond to that love and they calm down. And babies have this sixth sense about people. They can just tell when they're around good people and they have a peace with people who truly love them. So this is the life of the heart of that Pierre Thomas began to teach. And what he noticed is that these mentally handicapped people, they live, they're not quite using their reason all of the time. And sometimes they're not even living that life of the spirit. Severely mentally handicapped people aren't able. They, they behave more like a small baby, like a small child. And they're relating in love. They receive love and they give love. This is the way we're called to live with God. And that's the life of contemplation. It's in the spiritual life, to live contemplative prayer is to live an exchange of love with the Lord that's beyond thoughts, that's beyond um, concepts, that's beyond explanations, that's even beyond those beautiful graces of, of intellectual visions or prophetic um, experiences because those are something that are kind of tangible. It's a darkness, a darkness of love that John of the Cross would say is our great light. Oh, oh night, that is my guide, he would say in the canticle. And um, that's our goal in the interior life. And it's interesting because Teresa of Avila wrote the interior castle. And in her treatise, it was written at a time in the world where um, in order to be alone and to be safe, you would withdraw behind the walls that would surround a castle and you would go into the interior rooms. And in the most interior rooms, you could find that solitude and that aloneness with the Lord. In John of the Cross, he used the image of a mountain and in his time, in the same way, if you were to climb a mountain and you'd get to the very top, you were at a place where people couldn't reach you. And you could have that experience of being alone with the Lord. And, you know, even before the time of cell phones, you could still kind of have that on earth. I remember mountain climbing, you know, years ago before I ever had a cell phone. And, you know, you get to the top of that peak and you have no communication with the world. There is a sort of aloneness that you can find with God. In today's modern world, those images are lacking in a way because there is no physical space on earth or in the cosmos that's unreachable by people. Telescopes reach the farthest ends of the farthest galaxies and microscopes, there's nothing so small that a microscope can't see. I mean, there might be something, but you know, it'd have to be very, very small. And, you know, in the interior fortress of a castle, you, or the top of a mountain, you have cell phones, you have airplanes, you have ways of communication where it's difficult to find that solitude. I lived many years as a hermit, and it's interesting to see the way I was able to live the air medical life, 
you know, when I graduated from Notre Dame and it was in 2000 and 2001. And then I look back to the way I was living it just a couple of years ago. And it's, it changed. You had to kind of change the way that you found solitude with God. Well, Pierre Thomas theology is very appropriate for this time because the human heart is that dwelling place that is a hidden center beyond the grasp of even our own reason and the touch of other people. It's that secret hiding place with God. And the only place you can go on earth to have that um, aloneness with the alone, to have that time of real solitude with God, to commune with him and to hopefully respond to grace enough to reach union with him, which is the goal of every soul to reach a transforming union with God. The only place is right here, deep within ourselves. It's, it's, it's right at our grasp. The only place would be not only within ourselves, but say at mass, when you are sitting there before the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. And there in that Eucharistic heart, you have the heart of Jesus that was incarnated in the Blessed Mother, that be in Bethlehem, that quietly lived in Nazareth, that was exiled in Egypt for a while, then quietly lived in Nazareth, that taught, that healed, that lived, then that died, that was tortured, and then that was resurrected, ascended into heaven, and that is seated at the right hand of the Father. That heart we receive in the Eucharist. And it's there where heart meets heart and our wounds meet his wounds. Our desires meet his desires for us. Our gifts meet his gifts. Our plans meet his plans. That he's able to transform and to make our will meet his will and be transformed into that will so that we can find peace and union and joy and communion which is an exchange of love and union, which is a unpenetratable um, existence with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's incredible. So the word heart, um, it's much deeper than Valentine's Day. <laughs> and it's much deeper than just, you know, an idea of love. It's, um, it's a world in itself. It's um, synonymous with soul, but it's something that's very, very deep. And so we want to, when we're talking about the spiritual life, always try to speak from the heart. It's the deepest part of our thoughts, of our actions, of our desires, of our experiences. It's the deepest part of our emotions. Um, it's that deepest part of our love. And it talks here about being a place of covenant, which is a place that when we, we give ourselves to God and he receives that heart of ours, our free will gift, he's able to transform it and give us back himself. And and we are turned in a way almost into a God. Um, we look almost like God. It's, it's very beautiful. Um, so that's the idea of heart. So the show is called, the program is called The Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. So we're going to go to the deepest part of ourselves in the show, but we're going to talk about so many different facets that can also be very practical in today's world. What is fiat? Why do I love the word fiat? Um, my nieces and nephews, I have 73 nieces and nephews, and they're coming. <laughs> and they all call me Auntie Mary Fiat. Um, and what does fiat mean? Um, fiat is like my motto, but it actually comes from Latin. And so I wouldn't expect everyone to know maybe what that means. Um, I often write 
fiat after my name, but you know, in theology, we talk about Our Lady's fiat, and I love to talk about the fiat of Jesus crucified. Um, when the angel appeared to Our Lady and asked her to be the mother of God, her response was, let it be done unto me according to thy will, thy word. And that response in Latin was fiat, let it be done. In the Our Father, when you pray it in Latin at Mass, I mean, at our parish, we pray it in Lent and Advent and often in Latin because we have a lot of multilingual Masses. And Latin is a good place to um, unite the languages. Um, when you say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's fiat voluntas tua, let it be done. In Genesis, in the Latin, you also see the word fiat. Let there be light, says God. And what is that? Fiat lux. Let there be light. Fiat means let it happen. It's a verb responding. When we say fiat, it can be a verb responding to whatever God is offering to us. He might be offering us a difficult situation. We might receive an inspiration in prayer. Um, it can just be, you know, our day to day interactions with people. Um, it can be all sorts of different things, but what our response to God should always be is fiat. Let it be done unto me according to thy will. Thy will be done. And the beautiful thing about the word fiat in Genesis is that when God speaks a word, it happens. And so he says, fiat lux, and his word is creative and light comes. Well, I oftentimes ask God to help me fiat by lending me his word and speaking that word to me. I ask him to wash me in his word. And to say fiat over my life. Let it be done, Mary. Say fiat lux over my life. Let there be light. Um, let, let you have the graces that you need to love. Um, let you have the graces that you need to believe. Let you have the graces that you need to understand my will for you. Um, and that fiat, it's a creative word that when I say it, when God says it, it's giving me something concrete. But when I say it, I am also kind of entering into his action. And so I say, fiat, let it be done. I'm giving the consent of my will for God's will to be done in my life to let him enter in with his grace and his Holy Spirit and do something. So my, my fiat meets his fiat. And it's very, very beautiful. You can see that with God the Father who created me, who created you. And he's constantly trying to accomplish his will in our lives for our own good. So when I say fiat, Father, thy will be done. I'm giving him permission for his will to be done in my life. I can say it to the Holy Spirit. Fiat, Holy Spirit, come with your gifts. Come with your fruits. Come with your charisms. Come with your creativity. Find a way, a path through this wilderness of life for me to have a love union with God and through God with other people. Fiat, Holy Spirit, right? And it's also something I share with Jesus. Um, and with him, it's multifaceted. I can say fiat to the actions he did as a human on earth. Fiat to your healing. Come and let your healing action work in my life. Fiat to your preaching and your words. Let your words come and transform my life. Fiat to your suffering. Let me place my suffering within your suffering so it has salvific meaning. And you can pray over that suffering and transform it to be a gift for the whole world the same way your suffering was a gift. Fiat to your resurrection that transforms and, and transcends suffering. 
Fiat can have many different, you know, meanings, I guess, in that way. So fiat is a verb responding to whatever God is giving to us. It means, yes, let it be done. It's an agreement of my will to God's will. But it's also sometimes used as a noun um, when people talk about Mary's fiat. And it just means that moment where Mary said to Gabriel, when he said, will you be the mother of Jesus? Where she said, yes, you know, let it be done unto me according to thy will. We talk about that moment as Mary's fiat. And I love to speak about Jesus' fiat on the cross because, you know, when he, when he prayed in the garden, he said, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Fiat, Father. And it, with every beat of his heart and every groan of his love crucified on Calvary, he was saying, fiat, fiat, fiat. And, you know, at Mass, at the moment of consecration, he is, he's praying through the priest over the bread, you know, a fiat. Let it be done. Let this bread be changed into my body and my blood and my soul and my divinity. Fiat. Let me give myself to you, humanity, as a gift. Fiat. Let us be one. Fiat. It's just, it's all very incredible. So a cup of coffee. I need a sip. And we will continue. So in the show, we will speak about the heart, the human heart, which can meet the human heart of Jesus, but also the divine heart of God. Um, fiat, which is that act of surrender in the place of union. Um, and crucified love. So <sighs> crucified love, crucified love. Crucified love is very connected to fiat. Um, I have, you know, kind of some notes here before me. And um, Jesus' perfect fiat was on the cross. Everything he did from the moment he was incarnated until he died was according to the will of the Father. He lived in perfect union with the Father. And that's our goal. We are called to imitate Jesus. He, you know... He called us to, to um, be like him. What did he say? You know, um, come to me, find rest for yourself. I am meek and humble of heart. You will find rest. How? By being in union with him. It's not just by looking at him, but it's, it's allowing him to touch, not only touch our hearts and to, in a way, comfort us when we're sorrowful or encourage us when we're weak, but it's by infusing into us his grace, the Holy Spirit, the very Holy Spirit that caused him to live in union with the Father, he wants to breathe upon us our entire lives and to share that breath with us. Um, and it's in an exchange of breath. You know, when the Father created humanity in the garden, he took and he knit us from dirt. But then a very important moment came when he, he breathed his breath upon us. And the Holy Spirit was infused into us. And we fell away from God in sin. And Jesus came and he breathed on the apostles and he said, you know, whose sins you have forgiven, you are, are forgiven and whose sins that you retain are attained. And, and he offered us, you know, the sacraments. While he was on earth, he instituted baptism. And, you know, after the Holy Spirit came, he instituted the Mass, and after the Holy Spirit came down and the church began, it began to share with us um, the breath of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit that comes to us through the sacraments so that we can live by that same Holy Spirit that lived in his heart, the wind and the breath of the Holy Spirit that went through Jesus' nostrils and through his heart, that prayed within him, Abba, Father, thy will be done, enters into us through the sacramental life. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to live in us and we don't block him through mortal sin, that same Holy Spirit goes through our nostrils and washes our thoughts and orders our affections 
and prays at our soul, Abba, Father. Jesus, that lived and died, crucified and resurrected love. But it was in union with this idea of fiat. And we can practically imitate him simply throughout the day when we meet different situations and we pray fiat. Like Jesus on the cross, it, we can say, fiat, Father, I accept your will when we encounter something difficult. We can say, fiat, Father, I trust you with this situation that's so difficult. Fiat, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What a beautiful prayer and act of fiat. And it's truly the Holy Spirit working inside of us. Fiat, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit, my life, my family, my heart, my thirst, my pain. Fiat, Father, I thirst for your will to be done in my life, in the life of those I love in this country, in the lives of babies being aborted. I'm thirsting for you, fiat father. I'm giving you every ounce of existence that I have control over to do your will so that other lives can be touched through you working in me. Fiat father, give me peace. Fiat father, inflame me with your love. Fiat father, mercy. Mercy on my sin. Mercy on the sin of those who sin against me. Mercy, help me. Have mercy on me. Mercy, I'm your little sheep. Mercy, find me, I'm lost. Mercy, I'm wounded, bind up my wounds. Mercy, I'm weak, carry me. Fiat. Fiat, Father, you are God and I am not. I humble and surrender myself to you. Fiat, Father, you know best. I surrender the situation to your judgment. Fiat, Father, please fix this. My life is broken. The lives of those I love is broken. Fix this. Fiat, Father, I love you. What a beautiful prayer to allow your heart, every beat of your heart, to simply pray. Fiat, Father, I love you. Fiat, Father, I love you. Fiat, Father, I love you. Not only are we called to hand over the reins of our life to the Father in fiat, but we're called to do it in joy. We're called to do it in such a way that um, the fruits of the Holy Spirit can be born from our lives. We're not supposed to grumble and say, oh, you know, fiat, fine. But we're supposed to, to find joy in this gift that we're offering back to God. And we do that by praying fiat with hope. Hope means that, like, you know, it's like a light when we have hope in our heart. And to make an act of hope, it's not a grumbly prayer, like, oh, okay, fine, I'll fiat. But instead, it's opening up our hearts to allow that purifying um, light of God to consume us. And to give us those fruits of the Holy Spirit of joy and of peace and of kindness and of modesty and of purity, of self-control. It's a gift of praise. It's saying, Father, glorify your name in my life. Glorify your name. It's like Our Lady, when she received the message from the angels, she said, let it be done, fiat. And then she left and she followed in faith what the angel said about Elizabeth. And she went to visit Elizabeth and believed that Elizabeth um, could conceive a child in her old age. And she arrives at Elizabeth's full of hope. And how does her fiat manifest at Elizabeth's? In the Magnificat. The Magnificat that she prayed was a prayer of fiat. And she was saying, my soul, my heart proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Fiat, thy will be done, right? He has looked with favor on his lowly handmaiden and from all generations, 
from this day forward will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me in my fiat, in my littleness, and holy is his name. That prayer of praise is a prayer of surrender. And it's a prayer that comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that's within Our Lady's heart. Jesus' fiat on the cross was also anything but mumbled words offered in a begrudging way. He said, you know, it says in Nehemiah in the Bible, um, rejoicing in the Lord will be your strength. And so rejoicing in the Lord will be your strength. That means that um, Jesus's fiat was a fiat of rejoicing. So Nehemiah says, rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. And that's how Jesus prayed on the cross. He was crucified. His emotions, his body, his mind was an in incredible pain. But rejoicing in the Lord was his strength. Saying fiat, allowing the Holy Spirit to pray within his heart. And the Holy Spirit, Spirit always brings the fruits of, of joy and peace and um you know, positive things. And those were present on the cross, but it was deep within the heart of the Lord. And it didn't take the pain, but it was another aspect, another facet to what was going on with him interiorly. God calls us in our lives to imitate his fiat and our lady's fiat. He calls us to always pray fiat, um, like it was prayed in the Magnificat, like it was prayed with, like Jesus prayed it on the cross. To pray it not begrudgingly, but as an act of trust, as an act of love. So no matter what comes to us in life, we can say to the Lord, Fiat, Jesus, I love you. Fiat, Jesus, I trust in you. Um, and this will give us peace because it hands all problems, needs, hopes, and desires over to the most perfect, loving, all-powerful being that exists, who only wants our good. What a sigh of relief for me to know I'm not in charge of the universe, that there is a God who is great, who has me within his hands and is in charge of everything. What a beautiful gift. So this program is called The Heart of Fiat, crucified love, right? And we've spoken about the heart and fiat and crucified love a bit. Um, in subsequent programs, we will talk more and more because love you can talk about um, in so many different ways. Um, you know, St. Paul describes it as love is patient, love is kind, love is never jealous, love is never rude, love is never self-seeking. We could do an entire program on each one of those. Um, and see how Our Lady and how Jesus lived those things. Um, but love is our goal, and love is my goal um, to be able to be an instrument to help you reach that kind of love union with God. Because as St. John of the Cross says, at the end of life, everything falls away. And the only thing we will be judged on is love. But it's not love, which means we, you know, simply allow people to do anything they want because, you know, it's not an act of love to have adultery or it's not an act of love to have abortion. Um, you love is truly seeking the will of God for a soul. Um, and so we'll talk more and more about that. Um, and we will talk more about um, the experiences that God has brought to me in my life and my particular unique vocation. Um, I lived many years um, in the missions all over the world. I spent a few years in Eastern Siberia and then in missions in Africa and the Philippines and in Europe and um, very short time in Mexico um, and did some, some missiony work here in the United States. And then I've also lived as a hermit for periods of time I lived as a consecrated diocesan hermit with vows under a bishop for three years. We can talk about what that means. 
um, and how those graces maybe I could share with you in your life, since we are all called to live silence and solitude, prayer and fasting, poverty, chastity, and obedience in different ways um, according to our states of life. But those are virtues that can help all people grow in holiness. Um, and sort of being thrown back into the world now. Um, and I can kind of, you know, give some, some hints and some suggestions to how we can live this deep life of prayer um, and union with God in the midst of a chaotic world. Um, so I'm looking forward to this time that we are going to be spending together. And I thank you so much for the time that you've given me today. Um, let's conclude this program today with another prayer. Sweet Jesus, we praise and we thank and we glorify and we love you, especially for pouring out your Holy Spirit within our hearts during this past hour. I ask you to be with each person who listens to or watches this program. You know who they are. You know what needs to be said to them. You know what parts of their life need to be touched by your grace. You know their fears and their pains and their joys and their struggles. And I ask you in retrospect, to use this past hour as a seed planted in their hearts to grow their love of you and their love of neighbor. Mary, I ask you to pour, place your mantle around each person who is joining with me today, either on the radio or on the internet. I ask you to pray over them so that they have the Holy Spirit and the ability to pray and to live from their heart, to not be afraid. I ask that they have the grace to be able to pray fiat, to live love even when it's hard and it's crucified, to trust and to hope in the resurrection, to be able to receive those gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit of light and love and joy and peace and to spread them to those who they have contact with, either physically in their daily lives or through prayer, those they pray for. And I thank my brother and sisters, my brothers and sisters of saints for being with us, especially those who love and pray for me the most. I ask for the intercession of the angels, the seraphim and the cherubim, the thrones, the dominions, the virtues, the powers, the principalities, the archangels, and all of our guardian angels to protect us and to help us to continue to grow in union and love with the Father. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Thank you. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.